without needing to reassemble this confusing from Catholic Church. Because the city structure team was such, and other people of my, of my generation did as well, the structure was such that you couldn't talk, but not only be part of the choir, but listen, learn to the services happening all the time, the full typical of services. And the services were long. And when the text said was the priest from Jordan who during that period, he kept that that structure of services in place. And I think in more of his terms it's still in place today. Thanks, I mean. Yeah. So that tradition is really important in this respect. And that's from the platform from which I became who I am, I guess, in the monastery and with an interest in chant and a deep respect for our forefathers who wanted to teach us the rules, not because they are rules, but because church singing is a way of life. It's a way of living in the church. It's really important to try and get that message across, particularly to young people, so that church is not supposed to be a boring exercise and you stand on your feet and get tired, but to be interactive to grab them and make sure that they are participating and to make sure that they understand the language issue. Uh, make sure that you explain things properly, uh, to make sure that the, the repertoire and the chanting is going to be something that they can absorb or learn from. So, oral tradition in the Orthodox Church, for me, is extremely important. It's probably one of the most fundamental ways of getting the message across to young people and getting them to come into church. Because memory plays a key in that, remember and chant. Um, we do other things in the monastery, apart from Islam and Kenya, we do Byzantine chanting as well, and we do some Kyrgyzian chants, the villages we are still, of course. Um, we, our voice range is limited to two voice and single voice chanting only. We do not create, we, we have consciously created a system where we don't have three or four parts. Not because we don't hate it, not because we uh, don't like the style of music, but limiting that style of repertoire that is consistent and regular within our monastery or style rules, our service structure. It's really good place. Um, this talk I'm about to give, and that's an introduction, this talk I'm about to give is, uh, is not a workshop idea because what I want to be very conscious for you to, to take away from here is the pit that's the style of music you were singing just now. And what I'm going to talk about could be seen as a bit of chalk and cheese, could be separate, diametrically opposed to each other. I will show you that they are not diametrically opposed, but they have to be respected in their, in their contexts for where they stand from each other. And this is not a Znami workshop, and I'm not going to be talking about the things Znami in, right? Because this, uh, you have to focus on a particular style of repertoire, and if I'm going to give you this none you chant to start learning from now, and what you've been learning, what you've prepared for the weekend, that turn to percussion, right? In your minds, and with the ideas and concepts that church music is anything that you can take from little bits and pieces. And I'm actually personally opposed to that principle that you cannot, you should not actually, but people do, that you should not pick out just the flavors that you want. So what I'm going to give you is going to be a philosophical, deeper look into the understanding of aspects of early Russian music that is actually the platform for which contemporary Russian choral music has been built up from. We can discuss the history of Nami we can discuss the problem or issues or history of all the legal chant or all right style behavior worship in another context, another scene. I don't want to talk about any of that. I don't want to make any comparisons. I don't want to say who's right or who's wrong. It's a respect for the many fascinating choral traditions that the Russian Orthodox Church has embraced. Out of all the Orthodox nations, the Russian Orthodox Church has the most diverse um, and uh, uh, beautiful uh, choral tradition in the world. It has, it has, compared to Byzantium, compared to even before, let's say, in pagan periods, there has never been an empire that's been able to extend its 
this whole tradition and try and make it into one, one basket cup like that that's still gone, that's still being talked about because Renaissance or Baroque chant of the high period of Western monasteries, they were very, they were short periods that may have lasted for like two, three hundred years maximum, right? But in the Russian Orthodox Church today, if you want to talk about early pre medieval chant and stuff like Islamic chant or the next people's there, when I say Islamic chant, I'm talking about a family of different styles of Russian, early Russian ancient chant. There is a family of them. Islamic chant is the umbrella group of many different types of early Russian chants. Right? It's quite complex, it is diverse, and it's amazingly complex. Right? But when you want to look at that from, from that angle, um, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of Russian chant, um, it is still continuing today. It is still continuing pre-Mongolian invasion, after the Tartars have gone, after all the problems and sorrows that Russia has been experiencing, and it still continues to go through political upheaval, it still continues on with an amazing uh, musical repertoire, for which we owe deep, deep gratitude to. Um, I myself am not really a musician, I'm a piano, I'm a piano, and um, flute, um, and voice becomes a part of the natural instrument when you're in church. So I'm not a professional in any of this. I'm going to speak purely from my heart. Um, We are in the 60th year since the death of Kaido Kaido, who was just a cook, and this conference is more or less, I guess, in remembrance of a very interesting composer, um, one of many famous Russian composers that represents a totally valid um, church change tradition in the Orthodox Church. Um, there are many composers in Russian change. Um, so diverse yet comprehensive is our choral tradition in the Russian Orthodox Church, making it, as I said before, one of the most splendid, artistically gifted countries in the world. And indeed, above all, a spiritual oasis. It's been a paradise and continues to be, even amidst of all the chaos and confusion of the geopolitics, and what communism, and you know, the, the, the stripping back of monasteries during the period of Catherine the Great, or Peter the Great. In honouring the memory of Chesnin Pope and the greats of contemporary Russian folk tradition here, it is important and to, and to be mindful that there is another church tradition that's equally important. And for this, we have to carefully sidestep the arguments, as I said before, of who is better or less better. Right? And to be able to appraise their unique characteristics and directions just for this short time period. Um, and this chant we're going to talk about is the philosophy and meaning to this Nami chant. To begin to understand the musical quality of this Nami chant, or early Russian chant, um, you have to treat it as a totally unique phenomenon that stands separate in time and reality. Uh, and critics, unfairly, I think, um, and probably incorrectly say that it's not a chance, he is stuck in the past. Now, all the chant that we seen is historical, and it's all technically stuck in the past. The thing with Znam and the Spirit is it's stuck in shadows because we don't know of how it technically or really it was sung. In fact, the interpretations of Znam and chant are very complex. And you've got today in Russia, and I met some people recently, that have got very diverse opinions about how the Russian chant or Islamic chant should, say, or should be sung. And it is a bit like trying to find a needle in the next day, and we'll never know the answer to knowing how to sing Islamic chant. And this creates a dilemma for a lot of people. And so you've got to call, create your own uh, interpretation. Uh, and style on Islamic chant. The text treatment is really important, and Gilda actually brought this up in his, in his uh, talk, and I think it's 
actually fundamental that we understand text treatment. Um, because text treatment between Tsunami and contemporary Russian chant is one of the more noticeable differences between the two. We're going to, we're going to put music to sound to a side just for a minute and talk about text words. What are we, we in church for? To learn to pray. Church is a catechism. Church is there to actually teach people how to pray. And it's actually made there to teach you many lessons. It's not there to entertain you. Uh, so Znamini chant is complementary to text. When you look at Znamini, old Znamini book, you have the words that were usually read there, but written in quite bold, and you had these really strange symbols written on top. And they took a much lesser, um, um, if I could call it, um, uh, they, weren't, they weren't as noticeable as the text. The text stood out in front, and the notes and the squiggles on top of what they call kinky, um, were much less visible. And they were blocks of interpretation for certain segments of the text. The text was the predominant language. And it was the person who was reading the God of Sheep or the person that was leading the chanting to be able to interpret and lead the choir as to what was supposed to be sounding. Because none of the chant was a chant that relied a lot on memory. And every location had its own particular unique experience and none of the chant. Right. So, but the most important aspect, uh, regardless of the differences of interpreting Znami chant, is the understanding that text had to be the most important fundamental um, thing that had to be brought to the forefront. Um, and Znami chant being complementary to text, rather than using saturated melodic sound to text, and in spiritual terms, we can call this dispassionate chant. Um, and how does this help the listener, you might ask? It helps the listener by interpreting or appreciating the spiritual context through the many layered psychological meanings it paints in the chant. Whereas contemporary church chant singing creates a platform for the audible senses. It doesn't mean to say it's bad. Right? This is not my objective. But it does create a stronger platform for audible chat. And there's a whole philosophy behind this about sound and noise. Noise can be seen as a bad word, but noise is anything that creates anything that can be read in the ear through to the brain. Um, and this audible senses that contemporary Russian forward chat creates um, gives, permits a relationship to the text more emotionally rather than interpretively. Right. Something that is given rather than something that's thought about, rather than the contemporary chant giving a feeling about. Right. Because text is layered behind sound a little bit more. And that's what Gita says, really important, that we never forget, or we should be careful, that we don't let text uh, die. Otherwise, there's actually no point for us to be seeing that music, because otherwise you can go to a rock concert, you can go to an opera, or you could go to any festival of sound and you could actually experience, have a, a spiritual epiphany in that place as well as in church. It doesn't really matter because it was all based on sound. Right? And this is where the problem for some people when are uneducated in church music and amongst the laity particularly, that this becomes a little bit of a tweaking tool to be able to sort of like, you know, to be able to create a positive feeling for creating a repertoire and a structure that lets the text die back and for over, over accentuates sound, big, grand, powerful sound. There's only so much you can take before it all starts to end up as a blur and what we call just a good feeling. Right? Um, and for better or for worse, we can call contemporary church chant, and we don't take this in a bad context, as passionate chant. Passionate not being bad, passionate meaning in a sense of being attached to. That's what passion means, being attached to. Right? Passionate chant. And thus, for argument's sake, we can say that traditional Znamini chant stills the senses and people go and get a bit bored in church and think, oh, when's this going to be over? Right? And makes one more spiritually aware, whereas contemporary church inspires the senses. It awakens, the, it awakens with incredible diversity, Russian contemporary chant, amazing diversity to move us towards spiritual inspiration. Whether it's successful or not is another debate altogether. 
if we accept the position outlined by the teachings that focus on orthodox spiritual discipline through the, through the church fathers, stilling of the senses is the is a, is a balance we have to achieve. And the question there is that I leave to the contemporary chant, choral chanters and to the other hands of the here, and to attest to the audience, is, um, is it possible to create a sense of stillness in contemporary church choral, that dispassionate detachment in contemporary church music, so that it enhances the spiritual quality for the listener downstairs in church. They have to pray. Um, there's a difference. I mean, this, we have to remember in historical perspective, I'm going to shift out of the Russian context just for a minute, and let's look at the West just for briefly for about a minute or two. In regards to the Reformation, where the Church of England was created and split from the Catholic Church from the period of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. One of the reasons that was used under the Reformation in justifying the position from breaking away from the continental, the mother church of Rome at that time, was one of, one of the reasons being the surround the, the, uh, the uh, controversy of church music. The embellishment of sound, according to Martin Luther, when he heard from his palace, some of not him himself personally, but heard of some of his music being sung was disgusted and horrified that God re 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 required us to hear massive harmonies in order to be sound to move the soul. And that was one of the, amongst many, but for Martin Luther, was one of the points for which the Reformation re re creates a momentum where the, where the Protestant Church says that we have to do away with sound and bring back text as a dominant form and de-sacrifice what we call stripping of the altars as some people say right the church altar goes the icons go the church architecture goes the methodist building is square the reason why it's square and round and flat with no decorations is to strip the senses totally and to let the listener focus only on the word of god and so luther as part of the Protestant Reformation, believe that the excesses of sound in the high end of, of Baroque chant and the Renaissance was so complicated that it lost its meaning. And as I said before, we could go anywhere to an opera and you might well just have the same type of emotional experience as well as listening to Thomas Tells. I like Thomas Tells, by the way, but and amongst <laughs> many others, when you go to all those people in English composers, but I just want to give that as a just position that uh, the idea of stealing of the senses and sound and text, text within context. Um, the tsunami chant uses several methods to educate the listener religiously through its unique chant. And I'm going to give you three key areas you now of its function. Uh, first, the tsunami chant's fundamental musical principle. And I'm going to talk later in nature that we never hear or remember a pleasant melody, right? And this is one of the confusing things of, 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 uh, of its name and chant. It's not something that, that, that grabs us. Um, and in fact, I remember the joke you told me a few years ago, it was quite a long time ago, one of the, one of the right wing services, you told me that, I'll paraphrase you, is some in that he dabbled into a little bit as an army chant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I won't say what happened there or anything like that. But after after the completion of the service, one of the old Babushki downstairs and strapped the horses, the now for the came up and said, Who died? <laughs> because the soberness of the quality of Snami chant was confusing, it was too much of a contrast. So we don't hear the sound of pleasant chant. We experience a rhythmic accenting of the text that uses this subtle or some call a somber musical phraseology in Islam and chant, rather than melody to express the context or character of the text. The intention of this Islamic chant 
of is, is a focus on meaning, climax, central thought, its emotive and psychological energy, and is therefore experientially different, and actually completely different, in terms of what we call hearing tune, or hearing a melody. And if there's to be any true appreciation for Zanami chant, we've got to accept that the conditioning of our contemporary ear to all qualities of music, not just church, but the fucking called backdrop to sound, whether it's the fridge in the back to modern life, to what we hear in our earplugs when we go on the bus and trains and planes, right? As all having an influence and an impact psychologically without subconsciously, not consciously, subconsciously, on the way we understand sound, we want to hear sound, and the type of sound we end up wanting to create. This is a very important argument that belongs in a slightly different area, it's not my expertise, but it's something that I feel very strongly about, that we have oversaturated the sound, and when we start to start comparing an apple with an orange, it's not the stiff with virtually enough, let's just say as an, as an example, or Chesnikov, right? We are comparing two very different things, and it's unfair to say we have to compare them like that. Because we are, we have already been, um, we have already been um, stimulated by other qualities of sound, an oversaturation, perhaps some would say, and we have because we're not used to Zanami in chant, it falls into a unique mask of myself and it gets partially criticized straight away as something that is not important for us, therefore we just get rid of it. Okay. Um, so, yes, we are harmonically saturated with our sounds, with everything around us. And I guess when people go to church, then they need, what the reason for a church is a spiritual possible. You go to church not just to feel good, you actually go there because you need to be healed. And music, in church, good church music has to be simple as that. It's to give relief to the person coming into church. It's not to compete with the sounds of the world. It's not to create parallel models within the world. It's not to try and and um, and, and be famous like the world. It's there as a spiritual possibility. And therefore, chant has to reflect. The chanters have to have an embodiment or that right type of spirit with the music, with the right type of the wood of wood leader, to be able to understand and appreciate that chant is there for the salvation of their souls, and their job is to teach the others downstairs the same message. And subsequently, one of the major challenges in introducing any, any people to Islam in chant is this re-education of the ear to less stimulating and more abstract music before. Imagine swapping your car for a horse and a cart. Right? That's when you put some, when you want to put somebody's deep into tsunami chat for the first time, it's peeling the onion right back to its core. It's throwing you in the deep end. And you are totally confused. Right? And you need it takes time to use to any need a wood leadership and structure to be able to guide you through that. Secondly, the in particular aspect that is of tonal saturation in early Russian chant, uh, fullness is achieved through delicate nuances of rhythm and accent and movement as an the chant. Very often, less is a stronger or more profound statement than of more. And some of the contemporary Russian composers actually do that quite successfully, I think, where and this will move to the area of silence. And then there's the saturation of sound through minimalism that requires a fluid integration of its opposite, what we call and know as silence. Silence in church is something that people sometimes get a bit afraid of because the silence something's really wrong. Because the sound church has to be full of sound all the time. And during Zakvich I stay all the period before Holy Communion, when the priest is having communion, one of the problems that when dilemmas that choirs always have is to fill that gap up, to fill it in with material that the typical never has described what we believe. But for Russians, in particular, they go back over the last night's vigil and whatever's grand and big, as long as it doesn't give the priest heart attack while he's having a picture just now, right? They're going to they're going to put in. They're going to put in. Because this idea that we need to feel sound within church all the time, this nightly chance moves us towards the idea with its tonal structure that silence is an accepted mode of chanting. Now some of the chant doesn't go right. But it will have unusual sense of causes 
it will cause and hold breaths on notes, interpretations of particular chants will accentuate the idea of silence. When you hear silence in chanting, you are able to arrest your thoughts, the brainwave, the pattern, everything, the electricity, the generation system within us actually calms down. It actually starts to go a little more deeper. Um, for, for a sound to be heard and structured, it must be preceded by a contrast or an opposite, which is silence. And that's very important. Silence can't be measured unless you hear what's happening before it or after it. In much the same way as a thought not maturing properly, if it does not have time to move from the metaphysical to the rational. So I'm going to be philosophical here, so bear with me. The, this musical saturation is achieved through completely different components and contemporary chant. The third particular aspect to this dynamic chant, which we're we'll discuss here today, is the relationship between unison and polyphony. Two part, three part, four part, eighteen part, four part. I think I did it quite well. When a melody is not tied to a bass line, its psychological language tends towards a natural abstraction of sound. Right? Um, and that's in comparison, that's bouncing that idea towards abstraction of the idea that because we hear harmony, we think of that as normal. Only in the sense that we have lost the simplicity of sound and natural noise. We hear each note relative to time and tonal space in, in relation to the preceding note. Each note hovers independently in its own space in time and anticipates movement in the stillness of the next note. Indeed, some chanters sometimes flex these notes and change the meaning of the text and stress the, the wording, the meaning, without actually being officially written in the words. And you can say it goes to a little bit like a condenser, right, in the, in the contemporary musical sense, where a condenser is sort of like a, a, a short period for which the performer or the conductor, usually the performer, can all of a sudden start to interpret on a theme from that. That's what Sami chanters do. They will, in a big service, a good Sami chanter will actually go into a period of some type of ecstasy, that might be, but they will. And when they're in a big service, they will take a phrase and they'll take what's called for a run. And the other choir members will know the themes and the brackets of notes that he is leading on, or she, that he or she is leading on, and they just sort of like follow him, go through. And that condenser, same as in Byzantine chant or early ancient forms of Eastern chant, actually can go on for sometimes in the Byzantine chant, they go for 30 minutes of a condenser that can express what the leader chant is going through himself in a spiritual ecstasy and flight. Now, we don't do that in the Russian church. I'm not going to ask you to start doing that, right? But I think it's important to understand the freedom for which early chanters were able to spiritually express themselves in the text at the time moving with the spirit in the church services and not being constricted to page or text. The thing that I think about is what's in the conference book. Uh, in the past, as the hero, there are a couple of places where oh, 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 oh. that's one of those times. They put that into brackets. Well, that material is, um, is, is a synodical or late period that has been brought into the larger choirs and they put brackets around them because they, they uh, it, it was preferable to sing the shorter version all the time only the most brave and if you had the left if you had the energy to be able to uh, throw yourself into that but uh, that's a window what you just pointed out that's a window of the freedom for which they could choose or not choose to be able to expressively create music in church when they felt like that, right. depending on the, on the occasion, on the tone. On the, as long as they kept on the tone, usually the best of chants usually do. It's a very, it's a very interesting aspect. In, you, in old, an old right chant, you don't see a lot of strong condenser type of structure, but in the Byzantines and in the Copts, Ethiopians and Middle Eastern, as like 
I haven't been to any of the churches in the Middle East like Iraq or Syria yet, but I've understood that in Aramaic chant. Actually, going to, a mon going to two monasteries in, uh, on the border of Syria and Turkey in, in November, and both of them are famous for the Aramaic chant. And I'm going to be reporting them and hearing what a condensed is. We've discussed the idea of how the freedom of expression in chant works through music. Again, I don't want to compare apples and oranges, but it is important to understand the background and the backdrop for which the platform, contemporary Russian pop music, and Shestnikov were able to build up from. Um, going back in this abstraction of sound, when a melody is not tied to the bass line, its psychological language turns towards this abstraction only in the sense that we've lost the simplicity of sound and natural noise. We hear each note relative to time and tonal space. Each note hovers independently in its own space in time and anticipates movements. That whole condenser, we're talking about a condenser thing in Znani Chant, in the stillness of the next note. Indeed, Znani Chant has flex this over stressing, and even though it's not marked efficiently in any of the notes, such an approach to chant suspends or halts any contemporary knowledge or principles given to the listener. And gives the listener no mental measures or boundaries. And some people feel a little bit lost and actually very confused. As soon as we accompany a voice of any sort, we begin to what's called anchor the melody or the music language, creating a relationship of sound intervals and emotional context through keys, major, minor, etc. And that on the one hand enriches the audible message with contrast, but on the other hand dict dictates and restricts to a certain degree our interpretive license in understanding the text within the context of music. The melody is no longer free to speak for itself, but is regula regulated by accompaniment. The more structured and saturated this accompaniment becomes, the less free, personal, and spiritually richer, rich that text is. It doesn't mean to say it's bad, but it's restricted. Contemporary chant in this respect is the absolute opposite end of the spectrum of Islamic chant. Chant relying on structure, time, balance, relationships, and harmonic disciplines. And is perceived, I am sad to report, in many respects, particularly in some, in some church poor communities, mainly here in Australia and the United States, as the graveyard of religious expression when it comes to Islamic chant. And for that, I will vociferously stand, stand up and fly my flag and defend Islamic chant. But you cannot compare Islamic chant to contemporary chant because you don't like Islamic chant, doesn't mean it's bad. Right? You have to be very careful in respecting and understanding that you can agree to disagree, but you should never agree to hate or dislike something because you've never done it. <laughs> um, so it's unproductive and probably perhaps even detrimental to our church culture to pit one system against the other, as ultimately it must be acknowledged that all systems are equally valid arguments in their intention to express themselves in their religious contexts. Uh, the human experience is diverse, ever-changing, amazingly complex and deep, and subject to factors which can shape us or can call us to change. I.e., you go to a church in Russia for the first time, you're used to all this repertoire, like the standard repertoire, can you see this bit of all? Contemporary Russian culture, and you go to a church that sings as none of the chant for the first time. There's quite a few in Moscow and Russia. And you hear it for the first time, it blows you away, and you begin to think, and it plants the seed inside you, and you begin to realize that there's something about the style of chant, which is done for a lot for, for a few people, I'd say a huge number of a lot of people. The idea that there's something about the chant, and they begin to develop a liking and interest in writing to the world as none of the That's how it works for people to take it seriously. Cooks like me. Um, and ultimately, this type of expression and understanding um, within, with, with this whole human experience um, enriches our life in the church and with the person of Christ himself. Because ultimately, that's actually why we're in church. We're not in church just because of the building. They're literally just four walls. We're not just in church because of nice time homes. We're not just in church because of because of nice chance, we're actually in church because of one particular individual whom we call Jesus Christ to some God. That's where the music in the back of your minds has to be 
know, which relate to and connect to Him as the Son of God. That's a very important aspect to remember the spiritual context of Jesus. Okay. Perhaps one of the more actual problems that we face in our contemporary Russian religious uh, expression is not the preference for one style of chant over another, but rather this big chunk that we're facing, more so in the Russian diaspora communities, uh, of what's called uh, a, a salad of contradictory tastes piled into what we call one experience. I touched on that before. Unfortunately, this goes beyond not just chance. It equally applies to the architecture, the layout in the space of the church monuments, the icons, the decorative features, drawing everything out by means, and the effect that this has on our life beyond church service into the world in our life. So, that, by that I mean when you go to church, you are Russian Orthodox, you sing nice in the church choir, but when you go out of church, you are you quickly connect and click back into a Western, Western world, a hedonistic world, and you become a very different person, almost like a Jekyll and Hyde between the two places. The Greek Orthodox have the same, that, or there's a saying in the Orthodox world, that a, a little joke, it's not really a joke, but it's more like, a, it's more like a, a, an insight, that when a Russian goes to church and goes to pray, he feels that he has come to a very important place and he, is, he needs to pay attention. When a Greek Orthodox goes to church, and I'm talking about Greece in Greece, not only Greece in Australia, don't compare the two, that's also apples and oranges, and go to the church in Greece, right? Um, the Greek Orthodox person is going to, they say, they sigh, they go, ah, I'm at home. They have, the Greek Orthodox has a totally integrated system of piety between church and their home life. And I'm not saying that's the best model, but it's actually a very important model for us to remember that one of the problems we face in the modern culture here with Russian Orthodox, Russian Orthodoxy and Serbian Orthodoxy and Romanian Orthodoxy is that we sometimes tend to, tend to separate our inner church life experience and tend, to, uh, and tend to become something totally opposite and juxtaposed to it outside the church and become an aggressively very worldly person. Now, I'm not sure what it's like that, but there are a lot of people that do that. And I'm not going to, it's not my place to uh, criticize them, but it's, I think it's a job that we have to be uh, have to do in making sure that people understand that when you leave the church as a Russian Orthodox Christian, that the chant and the experiences within the church are carried over into your life outside the church. It's very, very important. Um, and this concept um, that we're talking about, this, this landscape, I guess we can call it in more broader philosophical terms, is known as erotopia or hierotopia. Um, and it's a topic that's used, it's a word that describes a sacred space. And we can call that a hierotopic relationship that must flow harmoniously from the altar to the priest to the icon to movement to veneration to sound to light to smell to atmosphere, all embracing the space sense of spiritual completeness, making us whole. When we move back, when we move, when we move uh, that wholeness, when we move back from the church to the world, for the true Orthodox Christian, this completeness must be his or her spiritual life energy drawn from their liturgical aesthetic. What you draw from the liturgy and from the chanting of the liturgy and from the text of the service becomes your life as an Orthodox Christian. End of that's a fact. That's not enough for today. Right. Our modern dilemma is not the preference of one chant over another, but the mishmash, the salad, the bosh, we can call it, the soyotka under the shuba, right, of our contemporary church culture, which can sometimes overlay and make it very complicated in understanding the simplicity of the message of being true to our Orthodox spiritual heritage and not losing sight of that. Right? And this offers us a fragmentary religious experience that mirrors the multiplicity, if we can call it, a fragmentary world experience pulling us in opposite direction from the wholeness that and the oneness of spiritual life. 
<coughs> the social life and the daily life that we should be educating all ourselves and one another into. So I'm talking about integration of chant into the modern world. And the clue behind this is, is one of the one of the one of the past, the history of chant is not just Chesterton Paul, because I think he's a very interesting individual and I've got deep respect for him. And for all of his genre who suffered and saw so much change from the end of the 19th century, when he died in 1944, the one year before the Second World War, the World War right? and just to think what he had to go through. But if we go back further in Russian chant and understand his name and opinion for what it is, it doesn't mean to do it, but to respect it and to listen to it and to begin to think about what it means to chant in church, then um, we, won't be, we, we will be keeping this liturgical life that exists between in the church and outside the church separate. And that's not correct. That has to be an integration. So, um, in honour of, uh, in honor of, um, of um, 450 years of Shakespeare, uh, this year, which you might have got a deep attachment to the attachment for. Um, that it's not about this chance or that chance, because that isn't the question. The question has to still be asked about uh, our, our future path, our future identity. I'm looking forward to Father George's talk because he's been talking about the future, which I think that is very important for us to consider. I'm going to be asking that chance. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for being attentive. And ask me a question, please.
can't come. Those are elastic. They're meant to be fitted to fit the words. Set it yourself. But it has to be done in a way that I guess with the rhythm, I guess the, the, the rhythm was not going change quite so I guess one of the things that I found in that wasn't, it's, I found was that I have to be careful that it's not going to change the rhythm. It's very particular. Um, and I'm sure you're correct, but the thing that I found was differently was syntax of words and being able to actually give them an extra note or text, like you're saying, subtext on those because it actually doesn't fit in the text. Because that's the way that the rhythm is kind of creating some of and I'm trying to be... But it is going to be shaped in the word, that's my point. Yes, I also try to find a balance not only for the words but also for the text, not for the music. Yeah. And work with your music. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find a balance. So I'm not, I'm not totally going all right, right in my way. But there's aspects I'll take out of it that I appreciate, right, that I'll take from it. And that is that sense of that is that sense of text by right, coming from a strong Russian folk tradition myself and you've got to take that out. Being respectful of that sound also can't be something that you know, when I listen to serious alternate chants, I sometimes say I can only have this for so much. Yeah, it, it is pretty strong. So there's a bounce of point on this. Any more questions for you Thank you for that. I've done just one question. I mean, a lot of people here, you know, might have sort of sung a bit of nothing before or seen nothing of a skirt written on the notes that they sing and they go back to their choirs around Australia and you know. They have this passion, well, look, we want to try and produce it. What, what's your advice to them if they want to start introducing it to the choirs? I mean, what is the best yeah, method for the resource? question. We, we've done it. In the last month, we've had two liturgies Sunday Very liturgies. successful. Yeah, I agree with you. That's right, really successful. Full Sunday liturgies. In wow. You need, I, I think People I, walked I, out, yeah? They did. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I, I think that I let other people in parish experiences talk about this because I can't, I can't talk about this. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that it's, it's, a little, it's a bit of a hot potato yeah. because there are priests and no, no disrespect to them whatsoever, but there are certain people, um, you know, certain priests and certain individuals in the groups who strongly believe that Sunday the chant is a dead chant and should be touched on. Mm -hmm. um, and that's their opinion. Right? Yeah. And whenever you bring Islam in Chant up, it creates a sort of a sore point underneath that somehow you are going back to them, i.e. the old right, the other believers down across the road, which is not true, right? So um, I think that what you have to do in my, in my whatever I, people ask me this question many times, the first thing I say is that don't dabble into something that you don't have any leadership or blessing for. Simple as that. The other. The other aspect is there is an ongoing prayer life in this place. Whether you think it's integral, integral, or the whether you think you may be able to integrate it with your whole life is a topic, but there is a prayer life going on in the place. If you don't, and to do something, to bring a sudden change to something, is like, you know, put a distinct bomb into the prayer life in the place, even if it's a great thing in and of itself. But to bring, to bring uh, I totally agree, but to bring any change is going to create a rubbish shot sort at some point in time. And but you shouldn't use the church service to experiment on. Right. This is really important, I think. That people will say, and I've seen in choirs before, they have not to say, oh what type of um charity can you see today? And quite a doctor hasn't made up his mind. And I, I saw this in a particular five years ago, I like mentioning names. And she goes, <laughs> it was sunny today, you know, we should we should do something that's bright and you know festive, you know, for a charity king. Now we should, so we have to be careful that we don't, and they depend on something for 20 years, right, it's a disaster. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't do something, we shouldn't do something experientially just because we have a feeling about it. And so if you're going to use, there's a lot of online resources that you can use. If there's a passionate interest about this Nani chant, visit Mumbala, number one. Number two, there's online resources that you can actually go to on the web. And I don't have enough, probably get probably no better than I want to. But um, there's online resources and there's enough material to create what's called your own visual library and just for interest sake to listen and to see some of the It doesn't mean you have to learn it, but to saturate the soul with sound and you get used to a good sounding point. There's also quite a, a sneaky way, is for example today we sang let's say a similar Smolensk That is in rhythmically in a style of time in the ESPF. 
So once people get used to that melodic form, once you strip away a voice or two, it's less foreign. So there's ways of approaching it through the cycle that we're not having. I suppose with Melbourne it wasn't so much because we often do the two part um, Trubachov yep. bits and pieces. So there's another, but that's here. Yeah. 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 Two part harmony softens the blow when yeah. you some chant. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But once the play gets used to it, you can move into music. Yeah. But um, there's many choirs and many choir groups. In, the, in Russia, there's, there's an amazing there's an amazing platform of many interest groups. And we had Beda Beda as an army workshop at the center of the monastery. Come from a group from Moscow. His name was Pedro Kuchon. And his style of chanting, of chanting, is very different than I like ever expected. Right? I heard of him in recordings, but his attitude to his Nami chant and the way he dressed, even though he wasn't old, right, he was seeing his, the way he sang his Nami chant was totally different. And I can't relate. It, it wasn't bad, but I can't relate to the Nami chant. So there are the influences I mean. Um, you have to be careful what you go for. Russia's like a big supermarket or a big chain. Yes, actually, there's a monastery in, I think, in Luke, I think, who's dedicated themselves purely to the Islamic chain, and they are amazing. They sing everything in unison and in two parts. That's absolutely true. They actually produce a CD. Yes, yeah, there's a CD. Uh, you might know the the you know the female monastery that that, that, that made the point in Nami Chant on a single or two night. I think it's even more good. Yeah, yeah we might have to find out together at the end of the CD. But there are some there are females. It's becoming it's becoming big stuff.